All right, so thematic mapping and cartography. Well, the first thing we're going to do is just to load in some of our uh, sample data. So this is the data that you just downloaded, the QGIS sample data. And there's a variety of data that we can play with. Uh, the first thing I like to do is to just sort of load in a raster file. Remember how we downloaded the SRTM elevation file for San Diego? This is the same thing, but for Alaska. It's this one that says SR 50 meters Alaska NAD.tiff. So I'm just going to load it in there. And you get this. This is technically, this is a hillshade map. We're going to learn this in about, I think, two weeks' time or so. So don't worry about uh, how this is made at the moment. Just know that this is actually showing the topography in some sort of pseudo 3D kind of way. Okay? And obviously, you can recognize the Aleutian Islands and all of that kind of stuff, right? So this is going to be our sort of base layer. It's going to stay styled kind of this way. If we go to, let's see, shape files, we can find one that says alaska.shp. And if we load that in, we get a nice outline of Alaska. Okay? So we're going to sort of just refresh our minds about the layer properties and this kind of stuff by right clicking on where it says Alaska in our little layers panel and then going to properties. So this is where we're going to do a lot of our theming for basically all of our um, data right, in QGIS. So right now you see uh, the little tabs over here on the left. The one that says style, that's really where we're going to live uh, today for the most part. By default, it'll probably come up as single symbol. Okay, And this is basically means that whatever number of polygons or points or lines or whatever, it's going to display them in exactly the same styling. In this case, it's this lovely pea soup green color here. right? Uh, just by default, we can change that color real quickly by clicking on the little thing that says color. We can choose the color in multiple ways. We can use the sort of color wheel. We can choose from a list of things. We can even potentially use a little um, color picker tool if we wanted to do that. So you can interact with the colors in any way you want, changing them. And when you do that, you click apply. And in the background, you, you change the colors. All right. So that's the sort of basic manual way to get in there in style. We can change the transparency of the entire layer here at the bottom where it says layer rendering and layer transparency. And when we do that in the background, we see the whole layer has gone a bit transparent. Um, alternatively, what's really cool is that you can just make the fill be transparent but leave the outline uh, sort of opaque. And that one's up here where it says transparency of the fill, right? And if we do that, and we look in the background, it's kind of doing the same thing over there. Now we can do this in a couple of ways. We can do it directly here. But we can also go down one notch in this little uh, sort of, I don't know, a hierarchical display, right? And we can get more properties. We can actually now style the lines separate from the fill. So all I did was go from this to this, right? From this to this. And now we can still go back and we can pick our colors. We can set the opacity of it over here. So we can make the fill be very opaque, but keep the lines dark. I can now change the color of the lines too, right? So I can choose that border. That was basically this one that says border. And I get the same kind of color interface. I'm going to make this lovely red color for everybody. So if I oh, oh, then hit apply, so now you can see that I've got my nice blue fill that I've made a little bit transparent, and I made the outline of Alaska blood red, right? So it really sh shines out at you, OK? And this is also a place where you can change the thickness of the lines. Here it's calling them borders, right? So that's this border width. You can make it quite thick, actually, and it gives you a little preview over there of what it would look like. So when I hit apply, see in the background it made the lines quite thick. And I can also, if I want to make them dashed or something like that, this is also where I can do that. So I made them thick dashed red <laughs> lines, which looks kind of funny on this particular rendering. right? So 
for a predict for a for a nice map, I would probably want to make those lines a little bit thinner. And I probably wouldn't want them red. I think, you know, we would want to keep them black or maybe some sort of gray like that. And we get a little map that looks like that. Probably make these dashed lines. There we go. All right, so that's just sort of real basic vector styling. This is a polygon map, so we have fill and we have the lines. And you can play around with that, you know, a little later. It's pretty powerful. So basically, a lot of the kind of things that you could do in Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop or the open source versions, which are GIMP and Inkscape, right? Same thing. You could do this in, um, in um, QGIS as well, sorry. OK, so this is pretty simple because there's really no numerical data behind this particular shapefile. It's literally just the outline of Alaska. So let's say we have some shapefiles that have actually some data in them, data tables, like we've been digitizing for our trees and that kind of stuff, right? Um, let me just see which one it is. So we have one here that says popp.shp, if you can find it in your little list of shapefiles. So I'm going to load that in, and it's going to show up as dots. What this is is actually a list of recorded cabins and stuff, all right? So we can actually have a look at the data, right click on it, open attribute table, and then we get you know, the attribute table. In this particular case, there's no numerical data really other than its category number, but that doesn't tell us anything. What we have is uh, a list of types, some sort of code, and then a description of what these things are. We can scroll down and we can see there's actually quite a bit of types, uh, but there are fewer, you know, general things. So building, settlement, that kind of stuff, right? So what we want to do is somehow take this information from the table and portray it on the map graphically, right, in some way. And we have a variety of ways that we could do that, right? So what we're going to do is go back to the properties, just like we did for the underlying shapefile. In this case, we're going to, we're going to want to not do a single symbol, right? We're going to want to somehow make there be multiple symbols related to the information in the data table. So if we click on this little up, uh, pull down window where it typically says single symbol, we see we actually have quite a few other things that we could do in this particular um, uh, location. So we'll get into most of these things, or at least the, the main ones. The first one we'll pick though is categorized, okay? It's just the second one down in that particular list. So we'll click it. And it looks different, right? You kind of lost all of the styling, and I don't know what happened, right? Uh, but importantly, you have a couple of different kinds of options here. And the first one you'll see is this blank little pull down that says column. And when you do this, you can actually see a list of the columns that were in the table. All right. So this is our way of telling QGIS to go look at the data that's in the table and use that when we're going to want to display the, the map information. All right. So I'm going to pick the first column because that is sort of just a fewer numbers of things, right? The one that says code description. We'll click that there. Currently nothing has changed, right? But if we go down here we see some more buttons. One of them says classify, right? And if we hit that button, it's actually going to go into the table, pull out all the different answers that are in each of those rows, and then put them here. So each row that has the same answer is going to be classed together in one class. And it's going to give you the description over here. Building, camp, ruin, settlement. And by default, the color ramp is random, random colors. And so it'll load random colors. At this point, if I hit apply, I can move this out of the way. You see all the dots now have some color detail to them. Um, and those colors relate back to these things over here, right? the data in the table. Random colors may be fine, right? And every time you hit classify, you could potentially uh, redo those things, you know, like get new. Let me just delete them all. Delete them all. Classify, you can get new colors because it'll just randomly pick the colors, right? And you hit apply and it changes them in the background. Um, however, we may, these 
these categories may be totally random, so it doesn't matter what color they are, uh, but they may be gradational, right? They may be starting from 1 to 10 or something like that. And that's when we can pick a, a color ramp that would be really interesting. I'll just pick this one that says orange to red, or actually oranges. And now when it classifies them, it starts at white and it goes to sort of deep orange. And when I, I, I hit apply in the background, we see that we have kind of a you know, ramp of colors from white through orange. In this case, there's only four things, right? So it's only going to have four colors, right? Um, of course, I can actually double click on any of these things and I can change the marker and the symbol to anything I want. If I want ruins to be a star, and I want them to show up in bright blue, I can absolutely do that manually. Hit apply, and then back here there's only a few ruins and they're kind of hidden um, in my map down here. If I wanted to change buildings to something else, I could definitely double click on it and I could change them. Um, there's a variety of symbols to choose from. We can open up other libraries, but let's just pick one that's here. Let's just pick a pentagon and we'll change the color to be, um, I don't know, maroon or something like that. When I hit apply, in the background I got a lot of maroon pentagons because there's a lot of buildings in this particular map, right? Uh, so that's really cool. When I hit OK now, actually over here in my layer manager, those symbols and the colors that I chose actually show up to help me interpret my particular map, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Everyone can see that? Okay, now let's add something else. Let's see, what was I working with earlier? I think it was, was it trees? I think it was trees. It's like a, all I got. Yeah, okay. So find the one that says trees.shape. You'll load it in. It's uh, another polygon uh, shape file, so not points this time, polygons. And we'll do the same thing. We'll go to properties. And this time, instead of categorized, let's go to graduated over here. All right, so this one has a variety of, uh, it's fairly similar to categorized, but it has a variety of extra tools, right? Including this thing that says histogram and classes and a few other things like that. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is just sort of interrogate our data. So we're gonna pick a column at the top to interrogate. Let's pick uh, just area kilometer squared, all right? And we're going to go to this little area here. Right now it says classes, but we've got histogram. And we'll just hit load values. And actually we get this sort of distribution. It's a little bit long-tailed over here because there are a few areas with large uh, square kilometers. But this lets us see the spread of the data inside that column, all right? And this is going to aid us because now instead of just loading unique um, categories, we can bin the data together in any way we want, meaning we can divide it up into any number of classes in our own way, right? And this will become a little bit more apparent uh, as we do this, okay? So if we look at our data here and we say, okay, there's a bunch of them that have very small square meters and there's a few of them that have very large square meters, right, or square kilometers. So that helps us sort of understand the spread of our data. Now we want to somehow show that in a color scheme over here, okay? Uh, by default, it's got this equal interval thing over here. So if we just hit classify, we get five classes. And actually what we have now is a key that says between 100 square kilometers and uh, 15,110 square kilometers, it's going to be white. Between 15,110 and 30,000, it's going to be sort of the next slightly bluish, right? And then you see that, right? So if we hit apply now, in the background, we would actually see the colors, right? So I'm just going to hit OK so I can, I can make my population go away for a moment just to make it a little easier for you guys to see that. So basically, you see the colors relate to these intervals. And we know those uh, numbers in there are square kilometers for these particular things. So what we're seeing is the darker the color in this particular case, the larger the, the complete square kilometer coverage in this, whatever the data table was. All right? 
So this may be okay that we want to have these perfectly equal categories, right? So technically there's the same number of uh, uh, variety in each of these categories, but maybe we want to change the scale on that to sort of show uh, more detail at this lower level because there are more areas that have sort of smaller square meterages than there were areas that had larger square kilometers, right? So we'll just open up our properties again. Here we go. And we can change that so that instead of equal intervals, we can do it in a variety of ways. Let's pick uh, natural breaks. And now we can see that by default, it actually is going to change this, right? So what this is going to do is look at our histogram and actually see where there seems to be clusters of data and where the data seems to change. And it's going to automatically put these categories, right? So the histogram display shows us the boundaries between each of the, the categories. So each of these lines is one of the categories, right? So you see how it's sort of stretched out now? And that means when we hit apply over here, our color scheme is going to look a little different. So we're going to have a little bit more detail in the sort of, sort of smaller range of this kind of thing, right? Uh, we can actually drag these lines anywhere we want. So if I really wanted to, I could drag a bunch of them down like this, you know? And then I could just have two like this over here. And when I hit apply, it's going to change the colors to show even more detail in the lower range of the data, right? So why would I ever want to do this? Well, it depends. If the data is all clustered towards one end of the histogram, here, then we want to have more detail where there's more data, right? And less detail where there's less data. So the reason why we would want to pull a lot of our um, values to the left is because there's actually more data over there than there are on the right-hand side. So we can do this manually. We can do this sort of automatically, like I said over here. Um, and there's a variety of ways. We can use standard devi uh, deviations. You can change the number of classes, right, to, to be quite a few of them. And every time you do that, you can go back over here and just check to see what it looks like in terms of the color, all right? Now, one other thing that might be playing against us in this particular display over here is that the color ramp goes from white to dark, right? From the low to the high will be white to dark. If all of the data is in the low end, it's really hard for the eye to sort of differentiate between shades of white, all right? So we may actually want to invert the color ramp so that the dark is on the low end and the light is on the upper end. We can do that really, really simply just by going here to our properties where it says color ramp, checking a box that says invert. And when we do that, we can see it. we've sort of inverted our map over here. We've inverted our scale over here. I'm just go back to the equal area one. And when I hit apply, Essentially what we've done is said, okay, now the smaller square meterages are going to be the dark colors and the larger ones are going to be the light colors. And that'll show up differently on the map. So it may give us a better sense of what's going on. Along with all this, we can do the same things we did before, meaning changing opacities of the layer. We can make it see-through in some regards. We can um, definitely edit the individual uh, classes by changing the color. So if we really wanted this one to show up, I could just highlight it in red for some reason, right? And uh, when I do that, that one will show up in red right there. Do you see? So we can do a lot of sort of manual interaction. We can do a lot of automatic classification of all of these things. Okay. So let me see what's the other one that I was going to use. I think it was airports. So let's load in the one that says airports from here. Let's have a look at its attribute table. And uh, we have a couple of columns in here. We have use, we have name, we have region. But luckily, we also have one that's called elevation. That's pretty cool. And that's actually real data in there. So let's try and classify the airports in the same way we classified that polygon shape underneath, OK? So same as before, we just open up properties, wait for it to load. 
and we're in our style tab, okay? And we're going to go back to uh, graduated and instead of the color, so first let's pick our column, right? Let's pick the LF column up here. So instead of color where we have method, we can now actually choose size. That's another thing we can do, color and size, right? So let's choose the size one. I think that's pretty cool. We'll leave them equal interval for now and we'll just hit the classify. And we actually see our same kind of ranges. So if we look at our histogram, right, we have our very equal interval classes like this. And when we hit apply, and I move this off to the side, you can see that we, we've got symbols that change in size. And then over here in the legend, we also have those sort of symbols showing their size, right? So basically, the higher elevation, the larger the symbol in this particular case. Make sense? Uh, again, when we look at our histogram, we see that a lot of our data is clustered over to the, to the left of the histogram, meaning most of the airports are at low elevations, and only very few of them are at high elevations, right? So here's definitely a case where we might want to pull some of these things over here. We can sort of set them manually to a, any place we want. We can sort of, sort of make this a pseudo logarithmic by sort of doing this, pulling this one over here. And when I hit apply, we'll sort of see that, the cut, that this has changed a little bit in the background. So we have a sort of more spread, right? We can um, go back to the classes over here. We can reduce the number of classes so that there's only three, for example. Hit classify. You see it's changed the bins now so that there's only three of them. One here, one here, and one here. And when we hit apply again, and I move this out of the way, you can see that's really changed the way that the map looks on the background. All right? And same deal as before, we can change the transparencies. We can change the colors. If you, write, if you select them all, you can change color for all of them. So let's make them a nice rosy pink. And there they are, pink in the background. And again, I could actually just click on one of them, and I could change its color independently of the others. If I wanted to particularly highlight it, And then we have that sort of middle one is sort of teal in this particular <laughs> case, right? The same deal you could change it's the, the symbol to. You can make it a star or something like that. Click apply. And there it's turned into stars, right? It makes sense to everyone to see these things. So basically what we're doing is sort of mixing our graphical sensibility and our um, data that we want to display. So what we don't want to do is to make bins that totally lie to our um, audience, right? We don't want to artificially skew them to just sort of make it seem like, let's say, there's so many, if, uh, if I did this, right, and I hit apply, it would say, oh, look at, look at how many high elevation <laughs> airports there are. Well, that's a lie because I've intentionally skewed that bin to be huge and the other ones to be small. On the other hand, if there's a reason to do this, like it's okay to do that as long as we know consciously what we're doing and we're honest about it. Um, and the only way we would really be lying is if we somehow masked the, the bins over here, if we got rid of them in our legend and just had symbols, right? Then we would be lying to our audience. And usually these things show up fine. Okay, I have one last thing to show you for this and then we'll talk about how to make final map products, cartographic products, okay? So let's load that POPP shapefile in again. It's got a lot of dots, okay? So let's say we don't particularly care about the data in the table. All we care about is the pattern of the dots on the landscape, the frequency or the density of those particular dots. In this case, like I said, they're buildings, but they could be sites or just artifacts in, in a smaller area, right? Um, so we can show that in a couple of different ways. I mean, clearly right now we're seeing fairly dense areas and sort of areas that are not dense, right? The north part of Alaska is pretty not dense. Um, but the dots kind of overlap with each other. Some of them are underneath. It's kind of hard to see that. One of the really cool things that you can do 
and QGIS, again from the properties uh, window that pops up, is to do what we call a heat map. All right? This has a variety of names in the literature. Heat map is definitely one of them. Density or kernel density is another one. Right? Just keep your eye out for that. So in grass, we wouldn't call it a heat map. We would call it a kernel density map. But if we select that, what we do, uh, what we're going to do is sort of in very, very, very easily interpolate kind of a raster overlay where the darker colors will be denser areas of points and the lighter colors will be less dense areas of point. By default, it's going to do a black and white one, but we can pick any of the color amps that we like. Um, I'll just pick this one that says reds, right? We can play around with some of these things over here, but right now, let's just hit um, apply. And then we'll actually see in the background, this is what a heat map is, right? So the darker areas are where there are more of those dots, and the lighter areas where there were less of those dots. We can influence this by changing the colors. We can invert the colors like we did before. When we hit apply, now the lighter areas are the areas where there were more dots and the darker areas where there were none, right? Makes sense? So that's a really unintuitive color scheme, so I'm going to change that back. Um, of course, this is now a layer. It's on top of all the other layers, and we can't see anything. So we have a couple of things. We probably The first thing we want to do is make it a little bit transparent. So when we hit it now, we see it kind of faded in like that. That's OK. Maybe I made it a little bit too transparent. So there we have that. And of course, we, we want to put this underneath some of our other information. Maybe we want to style our airports again so that the airports are not quite as transparent as that. So now we have a kind of nice looking map where we have the heat map of populated areas. We have our airports with the symbols showing them, right? I'm going to reclassify our airports so that the symbols are a little bit um, more honest with us, right, as they were before. There we go. OK, so that makes a kind of a nice map, right? So this map is showing the topography of Alaska in the background. We're, let's get rid of those trees. We're seeing a heat map showing where people actually live, and then dots showing the airports, and then the size of the dots is showing where those airports have to be at high elevation or not. Right? So that's a kind of a decent set of information. Now we want to make a fancy map to present to our uh, adoring audience who really wants to learn from our deep analysis of the Alaskan bush country. Okay. Um, what we're gonna, and how we're going to do that, we can do this a couple of ways. If all we needed to do is to share the, a JPEG or a TIFF with a colleague, we didn't care about having the map elements with you know, the north arrow and all that kind of stuff. We could go quickly to uh, Project, and we hit Save as Image. And what you're looking at on the screen over here would go out as an image, right? So Save as Image, and I'll just put it in my documents. And I'm going to call it fun graphic, right? You can choose what it is, TIFF, you know, bitmap, JPEG. I'll just save it as a JPEG. Hit save. And very quickly, if I go back to my area, here we have our fun JPEG. It shows up in my graphics program. Real simple, the basic kind of map. But it's missing all the elements that I said you got to have on a map, right? It's missing a scale, north arrow, uh, any kind of graticule or grid, any kind of titling, any kind of legend, anything like that, right? So if we want to do that, we have to take advantage of the map composer tool to QGIS. Now, Grass has one too. A lot of GIS programs have a separate map composer. And this gives you even more graphical control over your map and basically, it's sort of now even more marrying the GIS with a graphics program, OK? To get to that, we uh, go to the project, and we go to New Print Composer right here. You can do, if you're, if you're into keyboard shortcuts, Control-P, right? It brings up a print composer. So we do that. It'll ask us for a name, because we can have multiple print composers in any project. So if you have all your data layers, everything saved, Right? And you want to make different maps out of it. You can have multiple print composers, so you can make different mapping pro uh, products at the end of the day. I will just call this Map 1. You can give it a more descriptive name, like 
airports and people or whatever it is that you want, right? Just click OK, and a brand new window will pop up. This is the QGIS Print Composer, right? So it's got a whole bunch of new tools, and you're thinking, oh, great, now I've got to learn a bunch of new <laughs> tools, right? But luckily, a lot of them are fairly similar to our sort of interactions in the, in the map display, map canvas in the background, right? So what we have is actually a page, right? And we can change the size of the page to uh, match the size of whatever it is we actually want to make. So if we're going to print it, we might want to make it match the size of the, the paper in our printer. Uh, by default, it's got these metric ones, A4, A5, all that kind of stuff. So if you're in Europe, that's great. Uh, but we don't live in Europe, so we're going to want to find, uh, where is letter in here? Let me see. Okay, there's legal, there's letter, ANSI A, right? So that's an 8.5 by 11 size page, right? The next one down below that is tabloid, that's 11 by 17. So if you have a printer that can print 11 by 17, choose that, right? So by default, we're going to use letter because that's what our, most of our printers can do. That just gives us the page size and we can work within those limits. You'll see that there's actually now a sort of grid. The grid is, uh, in this case, it's in metric. We could change that. We could change the, um, the orientation. We, if we wanted to somehow make it print in portrait mode, we could do that. A lot of maps tend to be in landscape mode. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So we'll just leave landscape mode for now. We don't particularly care about the grids or whatever. So we'll just leave that. We could enter margins, you know, anything that you want to do to set up your styles, right? The resolution and all that kind of stuff. Now what we want to do is add our lovely set of layers from behind into here. And believe it or not, this is really, really simple. We'll go over here to our set of tools, and we'll find the one here that says Add New Map. All right, this is really, really easy. Click it, gives us a crosshairs, and all we do is drag a box. Inside that box will load all of our layers from whatever's on the map display in the background. All right? Is that cool or what? Okay. So we got this overview, but let's say we wanted to focus just on the Aleutian Islands over here. Well, that's pretty simple. We just sort of go back over here. Don't close out the print composer, just switch the windows. And we can use our little zoom tool to zoom in on the Aleutian Islands. And we can go back over here. We have, um, over here we have a command history, but we also have items, right? You see this where I'm clicking, command history and items. Click items, you see map zero. That's the map we just sort of loaded here. If we click on map zero, we have, and we go below, we have item properties, and we click on that. See, so I have items, I click map zero, and then I click the tab that says item properties. And then we have this first one where it says update preview. If we hit update preview, it should actually update to our zoom. If it doesn't do that, we can change the scale more directly over here. So the scale should be, let's change it to something smaller. So it's 176009. Let's just change it to like 100,000. Okay, so we've zoomed way in. That's way too far. <laughs> there we go. And we can actually figure out where we are by dragging it. So we have this other tool that says move item content over here, the one with the blue arrows. And now we can actually drag stuff inside our map window until we're looking at the part of Alaska that we want to be looking at. Right? That make sense? Has everyone gotten to this point? So this is the scale. Remember in the way beginning, I think I said like 1 to 1,000, 1 to 10,000 for map scales. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about the scale here. This is, I've chosen 1 to 5 million for this particular zoom in. So if we wanted to zoom even more, we would pick a smaller number. We hit update previous. Now it's 1 to 1 million. And we're really zoomed in on some part of Alaska here, OK? So in this particular case, I think 1 to 5 million is a good zoom in if all we want to show is the Aleutian Islands. Yeah? This tool right here with the little blue arrows, and when you hover over it, it says move item content. Some of these other ones, this one that's got the hand, will actually move the whole like window sometimes, right? You can zoom in on 
the actual map display, right? If you want to zoom in on the content. So you have to be kind of careful, right? So uh, this one right here that's got the sort of yellow select move item, that will move the whole map display. We don't want to do that in this particular case. We want to uh, just move what's inside of it, so we'll pick that one. All right, let's sort of center on the Aleutian Islands. Um, one thing that you'll notice when I was just moving the whole thing, you see those little red lines that are popping up? That actually are hints to tell us when the item that we're dragging is aligned with the center or the horizontal center, right? So when I got the two reds, that means I'm perfectly centered on the page. That's really great because graphically you want all your things centered on the page, right? So that makes it easy. And uh, we can resize it any way we want, and as we drag it around, boom, it's centered on the page, right? Big margins on this particular one. So this is something definitely you want to spend some time playing around with to get it all lined up like that. Uh, now what we can do is add a few things to our map. I'm actually going to make this a little smaller. Let me center it. Um, one of the things that we might want to do is just add a border you know, around it. It's kind of nice to have a black border around it. Oops. I'll change that over here. And you can do that over here when you've got this items, map zero, and item properties. If you scroll down, you can actually just minimize these main things. You see there's a bunch of properties that we can actually change, right, of this particular map. Uh, one of them is actually frame, right? By default, the frame is unchecked. If we hit check, it's going to draw a box around it, right? And we can change the color of the frame just like we did before. We can also make it thicker, so it's kind of nice to have a nice thick frame. Let's say like three or four millimeters. There we go. Uh, we could change the corners. We can make them nice and round. You know, we could do all kinds, all kinds of stuff with the frame. If there was uh, transparency, we could change the background color. You know, all kinds of nice graphical things that we can do. We can also add a grid, right? So if we go to the little item here that says grid, uh, by default there's no grid in here, so we could we have to add one. We hit this little plus, green plus, add a new grid. And we can actually choose the projection system for the grid. By default, it's going to uh, go to whatever the projection of the project is in the background. In this case, it was something with NAD83, some sort of polar. But typically, we probably want just to put the latitude and longitude. That's a fairly typical thing that we would put on. So we would pick CRS. We'd hit change. We get our little window over here. And you know, if you have the lat long up there, you can search for it. WGS84 lat long. Click OK. It's not showing any grids because we haven't told it the interval yet. Right? So we have the interval for the x and the interval for the y. I'm going to put mine at like half a, so if I put, sorry, half a degree, you get a lot of them. If I pick one degree, whoops, hey, stop that. There we go. 1.0, okay, that's not what I want. There we go, one. So now we have one degrees, right? That's still a lot of them, so let's pick 10 degrees. Now we have fewer, right? 10 degrees, these lines. And for the Y, we could pick, let's say, 5 degrees. And we'll have these lines. So you see how you get the lat long kind of things popping up there? If I zoom in on this. So that's cool. But we want to have them be labeled, right? So if we scroll down a little bit, uh, we have draw coordinates. And now we have the coordinates. So it actually tells us which degrees of latitude and longitude we're actually showing. There's one, minus 170, minus 160, 60, and 55. So that's pretty useful. So that was literally just scrolling down in our grid. And we might want to have a, the frame have a style that reflects the changing coordinate systems. So if we go up a little bit in this area, we find the one that says grid frame. We could pick one, let's say zebra. And now we have it basically alternating black and white between each degree of latitude and longitude on our map. You see that? In this particular case, 
our grid is interfering with the frame that we drew earlier. So if we remove the frame we drew earlier, it makes more sense. You see the white and black between the degrees? So that's really cool. If you have this, this is now the graticule that we talked about last time. So that automatically gives this map some scale. So you don't have to put a scale on it, but you definitely could, right? So we have degrees and uh, of latitude and longitude. Maybe we want a scale that's in actually meters, so, so we can have both of them. So that's pretty easy. We have another uh, tool over here, add new scale bar, right? That's really simple. Click it, and we just click somewhere in our map, and it automatically adds a scale bar in there for us. In this case, I stuck it down here. I could put it anywhere I want. I could put it up high. Typically, we like to put our scale bars kind of down low. We like to stick them maybe in the corner or something like that, right? Now you'll notice that over here, we have, instead of just map zero, we now have another one, scale bar, right? So we have two items. They're two graphic items. We can edit them separately from each other. If we click scale bar over here and we click item properties, we actually have a variety of things we can change. Um, in particular, we can change what we're looking at down here. Like if I really wanted to, I could show this in meters, I could show it in miles, right? And I can edit all of that from over here. Um, basically choosing feet, right? And now it's automatically updated to show miles. You see that? Now it says miles instead of kilometers. And it, it's smart, so it will automatically figure this out for you. Um, if I wanted to show meters, I would actually have to put one, and that would show all of these kind of things, and I have to put an M down here. So now it's showing the numbers in meters, right? That's a lot of zeros, so we prefer to leave it at 1,000 because there's 1,000 meters per kilometer, and we keep that there. And when we look at this graphic item, you see it says 400 kilometers. That's pretty cool, right? Um, let's say we didn't want it to, do, to be 400 kilometers. How would we actually change the width of this? Well, we would go down to the next one where it says segments. And we can change it. We can change the number of segments. We can change the absolute length. By default, this one is going to be 100,000 uh, units. So we could change this to be like 1,000. It makes it really, really small, or 10,000 like that. And then the number of segments is the number of little black and white divisions. Uh, by default, it puts some to the left of zero and some to the right. So if we make it like that, now we have, it's really, really small. Right? So let's put this up again like that. So now I've changed that so that it starts at zero and goes, in this case, to seven. I could change that to five, right? So this is really useful just for changing the scale any kind of way that you want. All right. There are a few other things you can do. You can change the style of it. Um, you can make it be tick marks like that. You can make it be zebras. There's all kinds of things that you can do changing the style of the scale. So this is all, again, your graphical sensibility here, kind of saying, where do I want to put it? Where does it look nice? What's the size of it? That kind of stuff, all right? All right, so we've got some of our map elements. We need more, right? We need more map elements. Uh, let's add a north arrow. This is a little unintuitive because there's nothing that says add north arrow. There is add arrow, but there's not add north arrow. Uh, instead, we'll pick the one that says add image. We'll just click that. We'll draw a little box over here. And now we have to go over here and find um, an image of a north arrow to actually add. Luckily, they give us a bunch. So if we go to where it says um, search directories, it gives us a whole bunch of sample um, graphics we could add. These are any number of graphics for any number of things we want to put on our map. But you'll notice in there there's a bunch of fancy little north arrows, right? We could go through here and find one that we actually like the look of. You know, I'm partial to this pretty simple one right here. Just a simple north arrow. And we can, of course, change the size of it just by dragging it and stretching it. Right? If we're a giant north arrow, we can do that. A smaller one, we can do that. We can put it anywhere we want. Typically, we put our north arrows either uh, large up in a corner, or we make them small and we stick them down by the scale bar like that, right? Just so that the, everything is kind of lined up graphically. So that's cool. What else am I missing in terms of map elements? What, what might I want to add? 
A legend, yeah, definitely might want to add a legend so that people know what these symbols are. Uh, that's again, pretty simple. Add new legend, drag a box, and it pulls all the layers, right? All the layers from our, our area back here, and it pulls them all in right here. So there's a bunch of stuff on here. Some of it we want, some of it we don't want. We can go over here. We can actually edit things uh, directly. We can change the text of stuff. So trees, we can say super fun trees, okay? And we click OK, and then it changes to super fun trees over here. We can change the font. We can change the size of the font over here. We can change the um, title font, right, to anything we want. If we want the title to be really big, we can do that. Legend got huge, right? Uh, we can change what it says there, like uh, overlay of things, right? And it shows up in there as the title, right? Um, let's see what else we can do here that's useful. We can change the map that it shows up. We only have a map right now, uh, one map right now. That's OK. We can change some symbols in there and the size of the symbols and a few other things, right? There's a lot of stuff to play around with, the position and size of each of the individual items. By default, it gives pretty good um, stylings, right? There are reasons why you might want to change some of those things. You might want to add a black frame around it, which I just did by clicking that. You can change its position and size manually by typing things in, right? So that's pretty cool. So we'll just leave that off here for now. What are other things that I might want to add <laughs> to this get very cluttered map at the moment? <laughs> we might want to add a title, right? So we can absolutely do that by adding a new label, drag a box over here, and uh, we can render it in a variety of ways. We can render it in just plain text. Say, this is my map, right? And we can then change our font to be big and it says this is my map <laughs> right there right um, if you know HTML you can style it with HTML and click this box that says render as HTML right? so that's if you're really nerdy and you like to do that kind of <laughs> stuff uh, there's a variety of things you can change here right uh, you can add arrows that like point to specific features on the map, right? So if I really wanted to highlight this particular um, airport, I could draw an arrow to it, right? I could add other kind of images. If I had a photograph I wanted to show, I could add another image and then search my hard drive for a photograph. All kinds of really cool things that we could show. I could add the data table from any of those things that we had before. In this particular case, it's airports, right? So I can show actual data inlays. All kinds of fun stuff. Like I'm, I'm going way overboard on some of this stuff. Um, if I ever want to delete things, I can just highlight it in this table over here and just hit my backspace, and it's gone. Backspace and gone. Uh, I'm going to get rid of my text overlays. I'm actually going to get rid of my legend, right? So we're back to a fairly simple looking map. One thing we might, we might want to add is a locator map, right? A map of an overview of Alaska. And we might want to style it differently from the map that's in here. So that's kind of a cool task. It's something that's really useful to do. The first thing we want to do is go back to our map zero, the data that's in the background. And in the main properties, we just want to click this button that says lock layers from the map and lock layer styles, right? So all this is doing is saying, when we go back over to our other thing over here and change stuff, it's not going to update now. It's just going to lock things the way they are. You can't mess with it too much. It's going to keep everything looking this way. All right? So we're going to do that. And we're going to go back to add new map, the same thing we used in the beginning. And we're just going to draw a little box in this corner. And by default, it's showing us the exact same map, right? Because everything is highlighted from before. Uh, but what we want to do is zoom out quite a bit. So we can change the scale in here to be whatever it is. It's a little too far. So I'm going to change it to be like that. And just sort of drag it 
and recenter it, right? So it's really messy because it's showing us all the same overlays, right? We want to get rid of all of those overlays. So we'll go back over here and we'll actually just remove them all. So let's see, remove that, remove, okay, let's remove them all by shifting, remove, okay. Now, if we go back over here to map one, we update our preview, all we have is this shaded map and that little polygon, the very first two layers we added on because I removed everything else. You'll notice this map didn't update because we locked it in place. That's really important because you don't want to go through the effort of styling everything and then remove them and then all of a sudden the styles are gone, right? So that's no good. Um, so this is really cool, pretty decent overlay. We want to tie these two things together and we can absolutely do this. What we have to do is go down in our list over here and we have this item that says overviews and we just add a new overview and the map frame we just want to pick map zero and now you see that little pink area that showed up in my overview what it did is it took the extent of the map frame zero and brought it in as a little pink box in our map frame one which is our overlay map so if I uncheck that it's gone and uh, I, do have I lost my position. Oh, map one. Okay. Map one. Overviews. <laughs> draw overview. And I choose the other map to be the little frame. Right? And so now that shows up here. And I can actually make that be none. So it's like that. Um, I could change the colors, right? I can make it green. I can make it. <laughs> less or more transparent. I could make it a basic box, right? Uh, in this particular case, let's see, I would go to simple fill. I would choose, well, basically to make that, sorry, all the way transparent. Click OK. And then I choose border. I could make, let's say, black over here. Click OK. And now I have a just a clear box. You see that up here? Same things we were doing earlier. We can do the same thing from here. Um, there's a bunch of other uh, things we could choose, but that's really neat. Of course, we probably want to draw a frame around it, a nice little inset frame. So now we basically have a pretty cool looking map. At this point, if we're happy with what we've got, we obviously we want to save, you know, click save. <laughs> you should be doing this along as you do this. Uh, but we can actually now export this as an image, as a PDF, as in a scalable vectors graphics file, something that you can save in high resolution. But export as image. I can choose any kind of format I want. This is uh, a JPEG, my awesome map, right? We hit save. Change the resolution, so we want it to be really high resolution for printing purposes. We can do that. Click OK. We'll go back over here, we find myawesomemap.jpg, and there we go. My awesome map, right? With all the styles and stuff up there. Any questions about that so far? Anything you want me to go back over? Yeah? Um, I wasn't able, like, mine did not show the stage um, overlay, so I wasn't able to see the other map thing. Yeah. The, so if we you're at map zero and we lock layers, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. It should be under main properties. It's not there? No. Okay. Well we can work on that okay. separately. That seems to be some sort of glitch. All right. Any other quick questions about this? Yeah. Ah, yeah, okay, so let's uh, grab a picture, add it in, and then just on item properties, uh, sc scroll down to where it says search directories, and just check that little arrow next to it. It'll say loading, and then it'll load up here a bunch of images. And there are a bunch of directories that come with QGIS that should have a bunch of images. So they'll all show up in this little area here.
You can pick anything you want. Little cell phone. All right, and then we have a picture of a little cell phone. Right? <laughs> yeah, so basically, this is, like I said, adding graphical capabilities into, um, into mapping capabilities. There are things we can do, changing transparencies and overlays and a bunch of other things that we could do. Right? So I've sort of scratched the surface here. There's obviously there's the rabbit hole you can go down. Uh, you can make really beautiful maps in QGIS. Right? We didn't even talk about adding labels to our points. We could certainly add labels to the points. We can offset the labels in different ways. We can change the fonts of the labels. We can do all kinds of stuff. We can make them have shadows. There are a lot of things we could do if we really wanted to make beautiful maps in this particular piece of software. It was really, really powerful. I encourage you to, at first, start simply. <laughs> make a basic map you know, with a scale bar, a north arrow, um, maybe an inset overview map, maybe a grid overlay. Right? Keep it really simple. Those are the kind of things that you'll make on a day-to-day on -a -day basis. But if this is interesting to you and you really want to start theming your data and making really nice map products, then you can definitely go really deeply into these settings. There are a lot of help files available. There are tutorials about everything I showed here. There are tutorials on the QGIS site that I linked earlier that can show you how to do this kind of stuff. And what you'll need to do for this class, for project one, is to take your trees right and maybe one or two other pieces of information geographic information and overlay them style them nicely come up with some sort of thematic display for the trees if you've got tree size one two three four that might make a nice categorized display for the symbol size right if you've got uh, tree types and there's four of those you can make those colors right you could make a heat map potentially on the density of the trees you can show both of those things if you want to as separate layers, right? So there are a lot of things you can think of. I'm going to leave that at your discretion. It's just up to you to figure out what kind of things you want to show thematically because you're going to write about them also. And the map that you make should be a partner to the things that you're going to write about, right? So you don't want to show everything. You just want to show the thing you're going to write about, density, the location of the trees in relation to the historic buildings or to parks or whatever it is, right? Something like that in your write-up. Any questions about that? I guess I should have stopped recording. <laughs>